I'm going to start off with an extremely brief explanation of a few terms before going into the history of why the 45 ACP was created. The Moro people are a majority Muslim ethnic group. A juramentado is a fierce male Moro swordsman that typically wields a barong or a kris. First of all, the very determined Moro warriors being fought in the Philippines were not stopping when shot with the 38 Colt revolver currently in use. Because of this problem, 45 Long Colt revolvers began to be issued by the army to replace the 38s currently in use. However, this also led people to start asking, why don't we find out what handgun caliber is the best? Because of this, the thompson Lagarde tests were held in 1904. The goal was to find out what bullets performed better than others and what calibers would be considered sufficient for military use. It's important to note that the 45 ACP was not used in these tests. John Moses Browning found out that the Army was looking for a new 45 caliber handgun. Because of this, he created the 45 ACP in 1904. In 1907, the Army began the actual testing of handguns for various things like reliability and durability. They didn't just test semi-autos though, they also included double action revolvers as well as automatic revolvers. They took the conclusions made from the thompson Lagarde tests and used them to make certain ballistics requirements including a minimum caliber of 45 and a minimum bullet weight of 230 grains. In 1910, the Army had narrowed their choices down to two pistols, the Colt 1910 and the Savage 45. Neither were sufficiently durable or reliable yet, so more improvements were made. Final testing was done in 1911. The Colt 1911 had zero malfunctions or parts broken in 6,000 rounds and was chosen as the winner. It's not hard to find a quote about how 45 caliber revolvers were more effective and had more stopping power than the 38s that were being used. General Woods said that a 45 will stop a man in his tracks and will usually knock him down. Newton's third law says that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So if a 45 has the power to knock down the target, it would also knock down the shooter. This doesn't mean that a 45 can can't cause the target to drop, though. For example, a bullet that significantly damages the brain or pelvis would definitely drop the target. What was undoubtedly true, however, was that inflicting fatal wounds with a 38 would not immediately kill a charging Moro. This meant that the Moro would usually live long enough to reach and kill American soldiers. The same 38 caliber revolvers that were used in the Philippines were also used in Cuba. In Cuba, the 38s were deemed effective, but in the Philippines, they were deemed ineffective. The difference here is that the Moros in the Philippines were extremely determined, and the Cubans were not. What is also interesting is the lower quote about the major who carried both a 38 and a 45. If a 38 actually was completely ineffective, it would stand to reason that he would carry a smaller 45 instead of the 38. Actions, however, speak louder than words. Both 45 caliber revolvers and rifles chambered in 3040 Crag also failed to stop charging Moros, so it's safe to conclude that the problem was not just that the 38 was lacking. These facts are not frequently mentioned when the topic of fighting Moros in the Philippines comes up, and I believe there is a reason or two why this happens. First of all, this contradicts the official conclusion of the thompson Lagarde tests, and the common belief that 45 caliber bullets have great stopping power. Second of all, there seems to have been a rewriting of history that has happened. In many ways, the 45 ACP, John Moses Browning, and the 1911 have reached legendary status. This seems to have contributed to the blurring of the line between truth and myth. This picture is a great example of this rewriting of history. The soldier in the center is holding a handgun that appears to be a 1911. It's very clearly not a revolver. However, I can't find any evidence that 1911s were actually used against the Moros. This may seem unbelievable, but I have a quote to confirm this from Robert A. Fulton, the author of a book about the Moros. He said, The new M1911 did not reach U.S. Army units until just after they had fought their last battle against the Moros in mid-1913. 
It's impossible to talk about the development of the 45 ACP without mentioning the Thompson-Lagarde tests. Thompson and Lagarde were primarily concerned about finding what rounds had the most stopping power slash shock. They used shock to describe multiple unrelated things including the following. How much cadavers moved when shot. How surprised cattle were when they were shot. And how quickly cattle died when rapidly shot. This chart is a subjective scoring of shock made directly from the shooting of cadavers. The first day of testing was done in an unscientific manner. Varying amounts of rounds were shot into the different organs of cattle at different times. If it was decided at any arbitrary time that the cattle weren't dying quickly enough, they were then killed with a sledgehammer. From the first day of testing, I have two cases that strongly detract from the conclusion that bullets less than 45 caliber are unacceptable for military use. The cow shot with the 38 long colt was shot with one less bullet, but still took significantly less time to die than the cow shot with the 45 long colt. Most cattle were eventually killed with a sledgehammer so the amount of cases we can directly compare is relatively small. The report concluded that the 476 Ely round was impressive and had the best stopping power. If you only look at the fact that animal number 12 died on the sixth shot, you could come to this conclusion. Obviously though, this conclusion must have excluded the fact that animal number 4 was shot a total of seven times. Of those rounds, four were shot directly into the head, but failed to penetrate the brain or have any effect. Penetrating and damaging the brain is much more likely to instantly kill an animal than any other wounding effect. Thompson and Lagarde clearly knew this fact, but must have ignored it as well to come to their conclusion. It's easy to see that the conclusions made by Thompson and Lagarde were at best questionable misleading and based off of unscientific tests. It's also important to understand that without Thompson and Lagarde's conclusions and the resulting army caliber requirements, 45 ACP would likely never have been created. Before John Moses Browning had his focus turned to 45 caliber, he was working on a new 41 caliber cartridge and handgun in 1904. I personally find it interesting that the non-45 ACP predecessors of the 1911 were chambered only in 38 ACP. The 38 ACP is a semi-rimmed cartridge that is easily comparable to 9mm due to its similar bullet diameter of .356 and similar amount of energy, roughly 340 foot-pounds. I don't think trying to make a handgun cartridge that can stop a Moro is really the best solution. There is two reasons for this. First of all, American soldiers typically had time to fire only one shot in a close quarters fight. Second of all, given what we know from modern gunfights and from fighting Moros, whatever caliber you have, there is no guarantee that it will immediately stop or knock down a determined attacker. I think implementing more bayonet training would be the start of a much better solution. Just looking at this problem from a practical point of view, it makes much more sense to hold a charging Moro at bay with your fixed bayonet as opposed to hoping a handgun round will stop him from cutting you down. With a fixed bayonet, you have the reach advantage against most Moros. Some Moros had spears, but generally it was common for them to have either a Chris or a Bolo. Thanks for watching! If you thought this video was good, make sure to like and subscribe!